Welcome to our first video of the World War II unit. Um, we're going to start uh, right away. Well, in class we talked about the good neighbor policy, uh, which basically was coined by Hoover, uh, but stated declaratively by Franklin D. Roosevelt. And the question we have to ask ourselves is how much of a good neighbor did the United States really become? I think in 1933, uh, Roosevelt had realized, as Hoover did before him, that the policy of sending in troops to enforce what the United States was doing was no longer working. And so there's a practicality side to this good neighbor policy, uh, as well as a uh, moral one. So what you see here is the Inter-American Conference in Montevideo in 1933. At this conference, basically, um, Hull, who is the Secretary of State, and Hull is uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt's Secretary of State. And as the Secretary of State, he is representing the United States. And for him to show up means that the U.S. has taken this seriously. So he said um, that Hull backed a resolution that said, no nation has the right to intervene in the internal and external affairs of another nation. We will not intervene as long as you maintain order. Roosevelt immediately won over leaders and the Latin American people. Um, now, it wasn't even if you maintain order, which is basically how the United States had been going on before that. But now this is, we are not going to intervene. Well, this is a, so this conference was one that really brought about um, kind of a change in the way the U.S. is going to behave in the hemisphere, or at least could be a change. So Court Hell voted for a resolution that we just went over. Um, Guerrilla leader Cesar Augusto Sandinino opposed U.S. involvement in Nicaragua's government. And you really expect us to believe that. And this, I think, was part of the skeptical uh, people of Latin America saying, is this really going to happen? Is this really a change? Roosevelt and Hull immediately won over the people of Latin America but not necessarily the intellectuals, not necessarily the government, not necessarily the rebels. Yet the U.S. Yet the are the U.S. truly going to be good neighbors, and that's the question that we're going to answer. All right, as you can see, here is Cuba. We know the Platt Amendment. We can see the U.S. naval base of Guantanamo Bay. And during 1934, the Platt Amendment goes away. And that's often what is said about this, this instance. But I think what we need to do is take a good look at what actually happened. Because this is really the first test of the good neighbor. Ramon Grau takes over power. And he is talking about Cuba for Cubans. And specifically talking about nationalizing U.S. businesses and land reform. Both in which foreign, um, which mainly the U.S. and Cuba... Foreign uh, companies don't like this idea. One, they don't like the idea that the U.S., uh, that people can, they're going to redistribute land because that means they might take land from American companies. They definitely don't like the idea of nationalizing businesses, which is a concept that we'll get into a little bit later, but it's a concept basically where the country goes in with their army usually or forcefully says, you are no longer in control of this business. Now, in Cuba, they weren't planning on paying. They were going to do what's called ex expropriating. Um, just going in and, and relieving them of the business and any buildings and things like that. It's basically what happens with a mugger. He comes up, he points a gun at you, says, give me your wallet, you give him the wallet, and you're done. On the other hand, um, there is also the nationalizing, where basically it's, it, it's in a situation where, um, like in, in baseball, where you have a player that you're going to cut anyway, and so you have a hard time making a trade for that person because everybody knows you're going to get rid of them. Well, in a nationalization, we're taking over your business. And so there's not much of a price for it because they're going to take it over and they're going to pay you what they think they should pay you. So nationalization is something the U.S. wants to work against. So also, Grau made the mistake of asking Mexico to train their army. Now, before Grau took over, Sumner Wells was already saying the U.S. should send in the army. 
Now that Growl is going to Mexico, because the U.S. is not happy with Mexico's kind of flirting with trying to control the Central American region, is that this cannot happen. So Roosevelt and Hull don't send in the military. They take another path. They don't recognize Grau's government. And they basically, in legal terms, say that Cuba doesn't exist until we recognize a sovereign government of Cuba. And by not recognizing this government, it means that Cuba doesn't exist. So if they don't exist, they can't sell sugar in the U.S. market. Well, what happens to the Cuban economy if they can't sell sugar in the U.S. market? You got it. It collapses. It's very similar to Brazil without being able to sell coffee. Um, without being able to export sugar to the U.S., um, this led Cuba into a uh, recession. Well, during recessions, people pick up guns and start shooting people. And in this case, what happens is basically Grau can't keep power if he can't sell sugar in the United States. And so Batista, who was a member of the military, the U.S. trained military of Cuba, took over. He was forced to sign a treaty. This treaty said, basically, that the U.S., being the magnanimous people they are, are going to take and take back the Platt Amendment. Well, Grau basically said the Platt Amendment doesn't exist, so this isn't a huge commitment. They take the Platt Amendment away, and Batista then has to promise that he will not nationalize U.S. businesses, and um, and he also gave concessions to the U.S. controlling Cuba. The U.S. also basically does two things for Batista. Like I said, they repeal the Platt Amendment and they also give them a special rate on sugar. So here's your special rate on sugar. We'll get rid of the Platt Amendment. You agree not to nationalize U.S. businesses and talk to us before you make any decisions. So the question is, was the Platt Amendment truly removed? Removal of U.S. troops. As you can see here, uh, Congress gave the, so basically, one of the big ideas of the good neighbor policy is to remove troops. This started with Hoover, but is something the U.S. did. So 1932 through 1934, U.S. removed all troops from Latin America. Nicaragua, Haiti, and Dominican Republic were the main places where U.S. troops were, but they call them all back. And Nicaragua, however, where the soldiers are here is a sad story. And we're going to get that uh, later on uh, when we talk about some of the dictators that the U.S. makes deals with in Central America. All right. So that's the first test. Now let's talk about the economic push of the good neighbor. As we were talking about in class, the, the last part of the speech, that uh, the excerpt of the speech that Roosevelt read, basically mentions trade as being a huge issue. So in 1934, obviously, one of the, or 1933 and 1934, one of the biggest pushes of the U.S. is to help the economy. And that is where most of FDR's focus is. So Congress gave the president the ability to raise and lower tariffs by 50% in negotiated treaties with individual countries. This is called the Reciprocal Trade Agreements Act. And this gives Roosevelt the ability to sign reciprocal trade agreements. Basically it says, you don't have to bring a trade treaty back to us to get approved. You can say, you can make deals. All right? This is like when you are constantly making deals with different people to buy something here, buy something there. If you always had to go to somebody for approval after you bought and sold a video game or bought and sold a car, bought or sold anything, it would slow up the entire process. So the idea is that Roosevelt can use this Reciprocal Trade Agreement Act to make trades quickly. Um, winds up making a treaty with Brazil, one with Chile, one, one with several other countries. Um, but most of the time, they had to kind of twist the arm of that country to do it. And so trade doesn't really necessarily increase. Now in 1934, Roosevelt, with congressional approval, created the Export-Import Bank. Uh, the bank, back, the bank would help facilitate trade by giving financing to South American companies and nations. Resume. Okay, so I fixed that. Bank would help facilitate trade by giving financing to South American companies and nations. And so this bank basically is helping companies in 
Brazil, in Chile, in Argentina, um, to be able to export agricultural goods. Because a lot of times when you sell those goods, you then have to have money that you bring back and reinvest in the business. And so sometimes you just don't have the cash to make it happen. And so you need to borrow cash to allow trade to happen. Somebody wants to buy a whole bunch of coffee. They're going to sell that coffee. They're eventually going to make money, but they don't have the short-term cash to do it. So then they would apply and get a, a loan from the Export-Import Bank and then pay it back. It is to help facilitate trade. And to some extent, it, it works. The U.S. exported uh, to Latin America uh, in 1933 was $215 million. Um, oh, The U.S. exported to L.A. in 1933 $363 million worth of goods. In 1936, they were exporting $548 million by 1939. Or 1936, 548 million, and by 1939, that figure had doubled. And so, what you see is an increasing trade with Latin America. Imports um, from Latin America also went up over 500 million by 1939. And so, the importing and exporting of goods is happening um, within within Latin America, and the export import bank is a big part of that. This is integral to the first part of the good neighbor policy, which is really let's be and, and work with trade. Let's secure U.S. businesses. Let's trade goods. Now, what happens then is basically as we continue to move on here, we see, the treat, um, we see another example of good neighbor. And then we'll get and answer the question of whether – um, good neighbor policy is really the motivation behind some of the actions as we move forward. But the Treaty of 1936 with Panama allowed Panama to reap some of the economic benefits that go along with having the canal. Arias, uh, the president of uh, Panama, was beginning to, or was using, a lot of anti-American rhetoric to get voted in and to kind of could, to get a lot of favor within, the, um, within Latin America. And so one of the ideas here is that um, Panama was then allowed to have businesses within the canal sector, to be able to sell goods to people traveling, to be able to make money off the tourism that was happening because of the Panama Canal, and also to make money off the business that was going through the canal. And so this gave uh, Panama a lot more control over their own canal and would be something that I would consider a good neighbor. At the same time, it was also to placate an anti-American president and to make sure that the U.S. had and that the Panama Canal was going to be uh, safe. Because one of the biggest issues for the United States is keeping that canal safe as it looks like the world is heading towards another world war, even in 1936. So, Inter-American uh, 1936 Conference for the Maintenance of Peace. Now, this was a big deal to Roosevelt. He traveled all around. As you can see, he is speaking it. And this is in Buenos Aires, Argentina. He took a goodwill tour for three months around Latin America, basically trying to build up his good neighbor policy, to build up um, good, na good uh, relations with all these countries. And Roosevelt was a uh, a dynamic speaker, a charismatic man, and he really won over the people of Latin America. All right. And so let's go back here. Um, what they did in this peace conference is they settled the Chaco War, which was Bolivia, Chile, um, Peru, uh, Ecuador, and um, Argentina. They all basically, and even um, Brazil to a point, they all pick on Bolivia. And basically take away Bolivia's port. Uh, and so Bolivia in this situation winds up losing. Uh, and Roosevelt's not so concerned with who wins or loses in this action. He really just wants to move on. Um, and then they signed a non-intervention pact again. Uh, but, but the U.S. failed to get their anti-fascism pact uh, created and, and agreed to because obviously... Brazil's not going to agree to that because they have those issues going on. And Argentina and some of these other countries aren't going to agree with any Okay, so as I was saying, um, so that brings us to the next issue. And this is where we really, uh, another test 
of the good neighbor policy. Don't you love that little uh, transition there? All right, Bolivia, 1937, Colonel David Toro Rulovo staged a coup. And in this coup, he basically was about Bolivia for Bolivians. And he wanted to do land reform and create reform to make Bolivia um, a country. So we see again that national nationalism that is all over Latin America. He then nationalized Standard Oil property, basically took it. Um, now, this is not a huge deal because there wasn't a lot of oil in Bolivia. They, they only export about 37 million a year compared to other nations. This is not uh, or 7 million a year. And so this is not a huge, there's not a lot of property there, there's not a lot of oil there, but this creates a little bit of an issue. Now, Hull did not send in U.S. troops. And you might say, well, no big deal. Bolivia is a little country, it's a poor country. It's not that big of a deal. Now, the issue with this is what it might create in the long term. And that is that it's not Bolivia nationalizing and taking over Standard Oil that's the problem. What happens with other countries? A spokesman for General Motors warned that no action here might have ramifications in other places. There might be huge issues. Okay? Is there a difference for the school leadership or administration between a student who is a loner and not very popular getting away with cheating versus a widely known and popular student getting away with cheating. Is there a difference? Or should both be treated the same? Well, you might say both would be treated the same, but there is a definite difference because one sends a signal to everybody and one does not. All right. Now, what you see here is what the General Motors spokesman was warning against, and that is this is Mexico with large amounts of oil, and both British and American oil fields from several companies, but Standard Oil is the main one. So what you see here is people of Mexico cheering in the streets because of Mexican, Mexico's action of uh, nationalizing these businesses. Now, they wind up paying Standard Oil. Um, now, Mexico comes in and basically wants to pay very little. Okay, uh, nationalization, it means that a country uh, where certain businesses are located wants to own the businesses themselves. They either pay or do not pay the companies for the right to operate those businesses. All right. Okay, here we go. Here is Cardenas signing that agreement to take over the... Um, take over the American fuel company. So you could see it's kind of like this um, sentimental picture is all of Mexico is represented here looking over Cardenas to make this happen. Uh, different responses, different response does the U.S. have to Mexico. Why? Well, I think we know why. It's because of the amount of oil that's in Mexico. Uh, so President Cardenas nationalized oil fields in Mexico. Now what he proposed to do was pay what the... The Standard Oil and other companies were paying in taxes, the value that they declared for taxes. Well, they declared a lot lower value for taxes than was actually there. Um, so they've been paying very little on taxes. And so basically, Cardenas said, we're going to purchase it for this price. This is what you've been paying. This is what we're going to give you. And they basically argued that, that Standard Oil doesn't own the oil under the ground. Mexico does. And so if they wanted to keep operating, they would have to pay large uh expenses. Um, and basically, they, they decided to go ahead and take over um, and pay the U.S. companies. Now, Hull decided it's time to limit runaway nationalism, as he termed it, that something needs to be happening here. So basically, he proposes to the Treasury to embargo silver to Mexico. Well, Mexico's basic economy is on a silver standard in some ways. They built the, the, their economy around silver, and silver is what supports their, um, their currency. 
And to have embar silver embargoed by the United States would create kind of what happened with the gold standard in the U.S. It would create basically a recession in Mexico. The U.S. ambassador basically comes to Hull and says, we can't do this. Uh, gives him an argument for basically how this would destroy the Mexican um, economy and would basically lead to more anti-Americanism and basically alienate Mexico and create basically a, um, an adversary at a time when in 1938 it looks like the U.S. is going to go to war and it looks like the U.S. is going to need the help of the different people in Latin America. And if they embargo silver, this might lose the Latin, that goodwill that Latin America had towards the United States, not just Mexico, but others as well. So, U.S. Ambassador talked him into backing down. He doesn't embargo silver. However, Mexico, realizing what could happen, winds up offering larger compensation of $42 million to the oil companies, which is a much bigger price and uh, makes everybody a little bit happier. So the 8th Annual Conference of American States. Now we're starting to move away from the idea of good neighbor and moving into being motivated by what is going on for the United States, what's going on and preparing for World War II. So they created the Declaration of Lima, stated that American states would meet to consider how to respond to issues concerning the security of the hemisphere. Basically, we're meeting to talk about what happens when um, Europe goes to war. In 1939, they declared the Declaration. Oh, so the Declaration of Lima is basically this idea that we are going to create a uh, group of ministers that will meet anytime there's something that we need to talk about as far as security. So the first meeting was in 1939 in Panama, and they create the Declaration of Panama, which was basically creating a uh, security belt of 300 miles around the Western Hemisphere and saying that we are neutral towards any conflict in Europe because World War II had started. And they de declared neutrality and declared that um, there needs to be a security belt of 300 miles. Now, it's a pretty empty declaration, um, but you can see how it's going. Now, the, the second exercising of the um, Declaration of Lima is, we'll come up later. We're going to talk about that later. Instead of looking at that document right now to save time, we're going to move on. So 1939 to 1940 is a parade of petty dictators. This guy right here is Somoza. Somoza is the dictator in, um, in Nicaragua. Now, I told you there was a sad story, and the sad story is this. Um, Somoza basically was hosted by Roosevelt in the United States. Now, Somoza actually became the dictator of Nicaragua in 1934. The U.S. takes their troops, or 1936, the U.S. takes their troops out of Mexico, I mean takes them out of Nicaragua, and Sandino, the rebel who was still fighting against the U.S.-backed government there, basically uh, has a peace meeting, and they work out a ceasefire with the, the then president of Nicaragua. Now, Somoza was a uh, guy who was in charge of the U.S. trained security forces. And so Samosa's job was to take Sandino, take him to the airport, and let him fly out because they had declared his safety. Well, Samosa's not a very nice guy. He murders Sandino, then murders the president, and takes over Nicaragua and rules Nicaragua until the 1970s. He passes it down. Um, basically, President Roosevelt once said this about Samosa. He is a son of a bitch, but he is our son of a bitch. Basically meaning that this guy will do whatever we want him to do, even though he's killing his own people and has a very uh, bad reputation. Here's Hull meeting with uh, Trujillo. Trujillo was the dictator of the Dominican Republic and also was not a very nice guy. He, when he took over, took all his, uh, the people that were against him and threw them into prison and then executed them. Trujillo used U.S. aid to bomb his neighbors and overall was uh, very negative, but he allows the U.S. to have a, a base in the Dominican Republic and basically does what the U.S. wants him to do. And so the U.S. puts up with what is a pretty unsavory reputation. And in third, we have Batista. Batista was also um, a guy who was not very nice, who imprisoned everybody that disagreed with him. Um, and basically was a puppet of the United States. And so in these cases, the U.S. 
and Roosevelt are welcoming people who have a bad reputation throughout all of Latin America and really beg the question, is this the good neighbor policy where we are doing what's best for ourselves and our neighbors, or is this what's going to be best for the U.S. In, as World War II is going on, and so we're going to put up with these dictators because they keep stability rather than looking at what's best overall. So we have one more slide, so stay with me. Um, we're going to look at the other actions under the good neighbor. Uh, 1940, the Act of Havana, which was those, that's under the Declaration of Lima again, called for American republics to occupy territory. Why? Well, this territory was owned by France, uh, Holland, and other European countries, and Denmark, which uh, they all had islands in the Caribbean, and basically as that were part of their country. And so the U.S. and other American republics take over these islands to keep the Germans from being able to come over and create bases because the Germans now own those countries and they weren't sure how much the French, Holland, and Denmark would then start working with the Nazi government. And so basically, um, now, Argentina accuses the United States of basically trying to expand and using this as a reason why. But I think overall, the U.S. was really trying to um, work against the Nazis and they were also trying to get an anti-Nazi, anti-Nazi pact signed by the rest of the hemisphere. And everyone but Argentina and Chile are willing to sign that pact. In 1940, they also, the creation of the Office of Coordinator of Inter-American Affairs. And so the question is, um, was this a organization to create good neighbor? Or was this an organization basically to convince Latin America to help the United States during World War II? The budget grew to 45 million with 1,500 employees. And here's what the friends must be won and the enemy conquered. And that was kind of the, the mission of the creation of the Office of Coordinator Affairs. Uh, you can see here they even got Walt Disney on board. Uh, the Chiquita, Chiquita Banana Lady uh, that wears the big fruit hat and does the little dance. I don't know how much you're familiar with those, with that. That came about at this point in time. And so they had movie companies and different people sending movies and sending things down into um, Latin America to show to show them that the U.S. really is uh, out for their, their good. Uh, Lend-Lease Aid is the last thing I want to talk about because really at this point we're starting to move into the U.S. behaving what are treating Latin America or working with Latin America to help win the war. Uh, the Lend-Lease Aid to Latin America. Lend-Lease Aid actually started, it wasn't related to Latin America. It was basically uh, Great Britain is the only one left in the war against Germany. This was before Russia got involved. And so the U.S. wound up basically going against their neutrality and basically giving um, all the guns and planes and things that, um, that Great Britain needed. Most of it went to Great Britain. Another large chunk went to Russia once they were invaded by Germany. And in this case, they used it basically to get concessions from Latin American countries. Brazil was given the most because of their connection or their geographic position to Africa. Uh, the United States realized they could fly planes there, so they built air bases. They also built naval bases as a way of patrolling that area um, and using Brazil as kind of a launching point for any invasion they might do of Africa um, on their way to getting involved in the war in Europe. Uh, Mexico, 38 million. Uh, Mexico winds up kind of helping the U.S. in the war, giving a squadron to the U.S. Chile was 22 million. Notice Argentina is missing. These are all, um, Brazil and Chile are the major um, neighbors of Argentina, and they are nervous that these militaries are basically ramping up and modernizing while they are not. So that's it for our Latin American, con uh, Latin American video. I know it is a little long, but thank you for being patient. And what I want you to, to do is be ready to discuss the idea of was the good neighbor policy actually the United States being a good neighbor?